everybody. This is Annalisa with Journey to the Goddess, regenerating ancient feminine wisdom for the modern woman. Today, I'm with the lovely Dr. Stephanie Zachowski. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Stephanie is a certified spiritual director, a teacher, and a cultural mythologist. So let's dive in, Stephanie. Who is this biblical figure, the Whore of Babylon? It's important to kind of orient her initially in the text that we find her in. So she's in the Christian Bible, in the last book of the Christian Bible, in the book of Revelation, which foretells of the end of the world, of the apocalypse. And she is this major figure in that text. So it's a political text. Initially, allegorically, she represents Rome, and she represents the early Christian cults experience of Rome. And so she's seen through that lens. So she represents an imperialism, unfettered, uncontained imperial power that is destructive, it is decadent, that oppresses others. She's depicted as this false system that is dangerous and destructive. The Whore of Babylon does harken back biblically to the Hebrew Bible, to the Hebrew captivity in Babylon. And then this idea of her as a city is a very old idea. It's in the Hebrew Bible. You see this female city and then you you can see like Athens and Athena and, and this history of using women as representations of cities, land, earth, mother earth. And then, you know, of course, the component I dig into is gender. So for me, it's very important that she is a woman that she is called a mother, that she claims that she is not a widow, that she is a queen. It is a fantastic tale, you know, we have the four horsemen, we have all the plagues, we have all the, the, these things that have kind of come to pass. And then we get to the whore of Babylon as this representation of Rome. And she is in line with the, the beast, who are all like, working in this oppressive imperial power that has taken over. And the kings of the earth are aligned with her. And so we see the foretelling of how her, her demise will happen. And then John is actually, the, the narrator is guided by an angel to watch the judgment of the Whore of Babylon. And here at that point that she's the great mother of abominations and she will be punished for her, her actions. I mean, there's a series of events, but she is basically s stripped down in what some say is kind of a rape scene. She is literally devoured by the kings of the earth and the beasts. And then she is thrown into a pit of sulfur. <laughs> like to ignite her, you know? I mean, so it is this graphic destruction of what we are told as a city. So we're imagining buildings burning and all of these things, but the description is horrifically of a female. At least in the structure of the narrative, you see that the whore of Babylon, the beast are, are pulled down. These images of what is condemned by the society of what we see as a particularly patriarchal society. Now, so was Rome in many ways. Christians don't get to own patriarchy. It's, it's, it's further back. But we do see how this Christianized patriarchy condemns this version in that way. And then you see how the Lamb of God is brought down. And this kind of virginal bride, the New Jerusalem, is united with this Lamb of God. And the people that have survived the apocalypse go into this female body that is really just abstracted. She's just a vessel that is pure and clean. And so you, you see this structure. It's a marital kind of structure of this is the wrong way. This widow who claims to be queen in and of herself is killed. And this virginal bride is brought to power because of her purity. And, and she's not even in power. She's just a vessel. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? And, and maybe dive in a little bit more into why it was important for you to tell her story. You know, I, I'm from Texas. I'm a fifth generation Texan. <laughs> I grew up in a Southern Baptist culture. Uh, and I say culture intentionally. There's a religious aspect, but I do think it also in Southern culture, there's a permeation of that kind of religious thinking in the culture itself. This is important to me. It's thread into who I am. And it's something I really wanted to work with in the dissertation. 
I also spent many years working for the United Methodist Church. I knew I wanted to work specifically in this system of Christianity, mythologically. Now, I say that intentionally, too. I find that when I talk about my work at Brussels, it's feathers. To say myth and the Bible, it freaks people out. And I think it's important that we talk about mythological studies. When we talk about a myth, we don't mean a lie. For me, a myth is a system of meaning that offers coherence and in many ways guides a society or a culture or a group of people in a very specific way. And we dig into those narratives and see what all that's about, right? But I am always sticking very closely to the narrative and looking at how the narrative moves and works in culture and in our society. And, you know, for my dissertation, I went really political. I had a friend, it was a classmate, just kind of naming out biblical female figures. And when the poor Babylon came out, I was like, that's it. I've got to go there. There's a lot of docile feminine figures in, in the Bible itself, but she's a very powerful figure. She's demonized and she's condemned. And she is a destructive figure. I mean, don't want to over romanticize her. She's, you know, she's, she's got that kind of destructive energy, but she is also extremely powerful. Someone approached me after the presentation and she was like, I never thought of her as a woman in all my time studying the Bible. That kind of resonated with me of like, wow, there's some invisibility there. We also have to recognize that it's a depiction of a woman and it's, there's some danger there with how she's treated. The current political literature around purity culture, around reproduction, around abortion, these topics were really where I started digging into groups that are publicizing and lobbying and doing a lot of information around these topics. And I was looking for, does this myth arise in that material? And if it does, what kind of work is it doing? As those threads kind of pulled, that's where those themes came out. And you would see this, the danger of the autonomous woman. I shouldn't say that theme only falls into this literature. I mean, you see it in the first wave of feminism. And the writings about that is that these women if we let them free, they will destroy the nation. You see it in the propaganda for uh, the women's movement. Suffragettes were depicted as these kind of sexually promiscuous women. But you've seen this autonomous feminine danger for a long time. You know, with that, you start like with sexual power. Okay, it's fra it's like dangerous. Why? What is the power behind sexuality there? What is the fear of following desire? Why does that challenge the structure of society? I think this can be traced all the way to the, the invisibility of the mother in the culture as a whole. When I say mother, I am all meaning the archetype of the mother, which is not necessarily gender specific. And, you know, fathers stay home with their children too. It is the aspect of mothering is, the, is that nurturing, what it takes to care for a child. And that is an invisibility in society. There's no cost given to that. There's no value given to that. And so I think you can start there, but you can trace that in some of the anti-abortion material where the fetus is shown holding a gun, you know, aiming it at whoever's on the other side of what isn't even a full body. There's this abstraction of the female body as if it's not there and an autonomous fetus, which again is an invisibility of what it takes to carry a fetus. The resources and the cost of that is, is not valued. So I think that tra traces back to that bifurcation of the female image and to the trope of the whore virgin but even more so into the stripping of the procreative power away from those mother goddess archaic figures. And, and you see that, that power is massive, right? That was stripped down and stripped away and they were abstracted and they were forgotten. And that power went to the male deity who now has authorizes the power over the human womb and has that authority. You see this biblically, you know, God opened Rachel's womb, God opened, you know, it is this authority over that womb, the invisibility that there's a female body attached to it. It rolls down to the invisibility of women in reality, because that is our structure of meaning. And that trickles down into what I think we see today in much of that literature. In your dissertation, you talk about the Whore of Babylon as being monstrous and death-giving. 
And I'm really interested in that because that coincides with some of the work I'm doing in my dissertation as well. But I think that that is important not only for the time period of the Book of Revelations, but as you uh, so powerfully explained in your dissertation, it bears uh, resemblance in what's happening in our own political structure. If we look at ancient mythologies, the mother archetype, there's a, a womb and a tomb and they're one and the same. The life-giving of the mother agent, of the mother goddess, is always very connected to the death-giving, that they're always carried together. You can look at that agriculturally, that we plant a seed and then we kill the plant to eat and consume. But we look at that in our life, that any time a life comes, that's also saying a death will come as well. And it's that full circleness. When we look at those mother goddess figures, they are these really cosmic figures that represent all the things that life has, including deep pain, um, deep sorrow, and and life. In that aspect, the whore does hold some of that death-giving aspect and her destruction. Now, again, I'm like going to be careful. If we look at the whore of Babylon as a metaphor for capitalism, it's a pretty solid metaphor. I mean, constant consumption that's killing a society if it's not held in some level of understanding. And there's multiple images that could suffice for that, but there's a dangerous destruction. There's also that mother figure just that isn't destruction. It's just the reality that with life comes death. With that womb comes the tomb. And the idea that you came in those ancient myths and those ancient cults, you came out of the womb and you returned to the womb of a cave. There was this full circle and the mother held you the whole time because it was that deep sense of belonging. I do sense her in those aspects of that in her, of those ancient mythologies. Our call is to, is to dig into those and tell those stories. There's a big feminist debate over the whore Babylon. I mean, she's, she's, well written about in that respect. This is a powerful narrative of liberation that's utilized by liberation theologists. And the feminist argument there is it's more powerful in that respect. We need to put gender into its time period and, and, and stay with the power of this liberation. And then there's like those that are like, no, there's too much misogyny and damage in this. It's irredeemable. We cannot find any Christian use of, of this story. For me, this idea that and this is Judith Butler, this feminine symbolism reflects patriarchal structures. What is it reflecting? What is it saying? How do we dig into that? And the same thing with Butler, that the thing that is ostracized from society, that's deemed dangerous, is usually in honor of the structure itself. So if patriarchy is the structure and we're questioning it, then it's worth looking at the things that have been shunned out to see what's there and that, in essence, where she's been condemned is also the spaces of power that can challenge patriarchy. Reclaiming is complex. It's kind of what I want to say, that we have to hold both, that she is destructive and dangerous, the oppressor, she's all these things, and she's the liberator. She can be this mode of stepping into female power, and that Ability to hold complexity is difficult. So if we read the biblical text, it tells us the whore is evil. And we can take that at face value and walk away. Or we can step into this image and dig into it and see, well, what's that about? If this text that's patriarchal in nature is telling us she is evil, well, then it's written on by patriarchy. So what is she outside of that oppression? It's a difficult paradox to hold. And yet I think it's a really vivifying, life-giving, powerful space to kind of step into because we can look at how perhaps we are in a culture where we know we're in a culture where we have privilege. You know, in the United States, we have availability to a lot more resources and <laughs> we can look at how we have been oppressed by a patriarchal structure. So that's like kind of the meta narrative, the meta mythology of, of holding the duplicity of this image. And, and I think she's so representative of that because she is this imperial queen, this powerful destructive figure. And yet her marking, there's been scholarship that the tattooing that's on her forehead marks her as 
a Roman enslaved prostitute. That that was how the the marking was done. So she holds this tension of both and. There's been womanist writings about this. It, it's a rich, rich image. When I think about why it's important to dig back into our Christian narratives, because, and there's been scholarship on this, is, you know, Christianity as a whole is really entangled with the structures of the United States and its functioning and its thinking. And if you look at just apocalypse, right, and you look at how the apocalypse has kind of infiltrated into pop culture and moved into all these spaces, and you think, well, that's the zombie apocalypse. But you'd be surprised how many pop cultural references to apocalypse really resonate with Revelation, the book of Revelation. And so you're seeing how a perhaps non-Christian society or someone who is not Christian is still influenced by a Christian narrative, unbeknownst. And so I think it's, some of that is fine. You know, I mean, it, it's in, in fun, it's an entertainment, but you also, there's an awareness of it. And particularly as a woman, if you want to be aware of mechanisms that, that are binding you in a society, particularly if it's a religious system you don't even subscribe to. It's important to know what drives decisions in our cultures, in our politics, and in ourselves. This myth, this story, this meaning, this narrative of coherence is one of those spaces that's important to dig into. Wow. That's a hard question. We all come from different backgrounds. For me and my background, there was a lot of fear digging into these systems that we build to kind of understand the world. This, this writing, this frustration of just wrestling with these kind of demons inside of me throughout this dissertation. The revelation with that was that so many things I had been socialized into and had learned as very meaningful to me were also very containing of my own power, that I had been taught to contain myself in, in a multiplicity of ways. Being able to hold the complexity enough to step into that same story and see, okay, how can I reclaim some of this? For you know the work that I'm doing, but for myself, to others digging in, there's fear there, but don't let fear keep you from being curious. Christianity is strong enough to handle our hard questions. I think there's a lot of fear that we're going to lose our faith. And I think our faith strengthens when we ask questions that are hard. Dr. Stephanie, you and two other women who also are doc have their doctorates from Pacifica have started a myth, a yearly myth conference called Mythologium for myth enthusiasts and myth scholars to convene and discuss all things mythic. <laughs> and so we have an upcoming mythologium in uh, last day of July through beginning of August, correct? The mythologium is from July 31st to August 2nd, it's a two and a half day conference. And it, registration goes on until July 15th. And you can find it at myth2020.com. This year, because of the pandemic, we've gone online and there is still plenty of time to register. The focus is to bring mythologists' voices, uh, you know, together because magic happens like this when mythologists gather. We talk about various topics through a mythological lens. We also include writing exercises and different ways to help people kind of uh, work the ideas that come into the space. And anyone can register. You don't have to be a scholar. Anyone can register to attend and soak up the myth. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Now is the time that you can let people know all about your wonderful work and how they can find out more about you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Annalisa, for having me. This has been amazing. And yeah, if you want to find out more about my work, you can uh, head over to my website. It is stephaniezachowski.com, and there will be a link in the box below because my name is very difficult to spell. <laughs> I am going to start a workshop in... Um, September, I'm going to be offering a workshop in September, really kind of digging into the material we talked about here, looking at these kind of identifying narratives that bind us, that we have internalized, 
and really starting that work of reclaiming those narratives and, and what that looks like. Wonderful. Okay. So thank you to everybody at home. If you like what you saw, please like this video and subscribe to my channel and leave a comment. We always love comments. And also, if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways, then I encourage you to head on over to my Patreon page and learn more about membership. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao.